All right, welcome everyone. Um, and um, I have the pleasure of introducing Terry Golightly. She's the online education instructional designer and course coordinator at Johnson University. And she's gonna be talking to us about thriving as little fish in a big ocean. So um, please uh, welcome Terry. And uh, I, Terry, do you wanna take questions as we go or save them to the end? Yeah, I'm pretty open. Um, you know, I've got I've got several slides to go through, but um, since we have such a huge crowd, I feel like we can <laughs> probably be pretty informal. Okay, well, I'll keep an and eye they're on all the friends chat, too. but I'm sure, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Terry will, will be able to also keep an eye on the chat. So I'll try to um, surface any questions if you don't see them. Um, okay. And uh, just a quick reminder: the session's being recorded, and if you're not talking, um, please try to turn off your microphone and um, camera so we don't get any background noise or distracting uh, video. So, which we do um, have right now. Which we have sure. right now. I'm going to mute somebody. There we go. Um, all right, so take it away, Terry. All right. I want to talk about thriving as little fish in a big ocean as a member of the LAMP Consortium, and I have been since its early days. And um, I know you've heard a lot about the LAMP Consortium in different contexts, but probably rarely from somebody who's actually a participant. But the main takeaways that I want you to have from today is to realize that collaboration works when you're willing to adapt and consider each other. Second point, you have to work a collaboration. It doesn't just happen. You have to participate and you, it's like a potluck. You, if nobody brings any food to a potluck, everybody goes hungry. And in a collaboration, you have to bring yourself and your skills and your talents to a collaboration. But through a collaboration, you can thrive where you might otherwise not even survive. And I think this is true with our small schools. Uh, around 2005, I was working at Kentucky Christian University and we, we received the, the clarion call from the college president and he said the future is online. We have to adapt to online learning. We have to learn how to do this. I looked around at the faculty. I was a, an administrative assistant. I looked around at the faculty and I thought they look glazed over and it's not going to happen. If it's up to me, it's got to be me. And so I, looked, I decided that I was going to take that bull from by the horns. And the call came out from Appalachian College Association that they wanted to form a collaborative group to see if there was a way to um, work together and promote online learning through all of their 35 or so campuses for those that were willing. This was not an entirely foreign idea to me because the ACA had put together a drama and music group that my husband had participated in just before. And they traveled all over the different campuses presenting some Renaissance music and drama. And so I thought, sure, why not? Online learning, music and drama, it works for me. So, <laughs> when, um, when the call came out from uh, ACA to do that and Martin collaborated, began a collaboration with Tim Wiblin and Brad Markham, and they pulled together workshops and started to train people in two week long sessions um, on WebCT which was the first LMS that we worked on. It took two weeks to train people how to do at WebCT from knowing absolutely nothing beyond maybe email attachments to being able to sort of kind of begin to work some of the tools. But they established themselves as what we ended up calling Uber coordinators um, because what you have is you have a, a system where we have a single instance of an LMS that's going out over multiple campuses and if you have an administrator, a campus administrator, like you would at a major campus, we have to have those breaking out over multiple campuses, but we needed somebody, a, a different level of hierarchy in order to oversee the whole. And they asked me to be an Uber coordinator around 2008. Currently, Dave Eveland is an Uber coordinator. Um, and I'm at Johnson University, but that just gets you up to date on there. But going back, 
in the early days, the IT support uh, was at uh, the Appalachian College Association servers, and that really became unstable. And you'd be working along and boom, the whole system's down and you don't know when it's back up. After a while of trying to work through this and get it to kind of, you know, after a while, oh, Sakai doesn't work. It's just always down. It just blah, 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 blah. So long sight to the rescue. And this made all the difference. Long sight worked with Martin to uh, come up with a model whereby all the schools together could pay them to operate like a big university and the fees would be broken down as in active user accounts um, in a way that the schools could handle it because the primary requirement of all these poor rural schools is that it doesn't cost very much. Cost is the big determiner. Now, how does LAMP meet the needs of these schools? The first need of the school is cost containment and stability and performance stability. And LAMP meets these because LAMP knows this. LAMP now is Martin. He knows this, that the cost, if, if it costs anything, a school probably doesn't want to do it unless the value of doing that is very, very high. Financial sustainability is also important to LAMP. These are the founding and investing in people. The, um, Martin talked yesterday about the purpose behind what we do, and it's investing in people in all of these. The needs of the schools also involve uh, sharing resources with each other, bringing it all to the potluck, bringing it all and putting it on the table, and having a community of experiences when I develop a skill in something, I can share it with you so you can have that skill. You've got another, you've got a CSS sheet you're going to share with me so I can have that. And in this, we've had shared governance so that all the schools collaborate together and decide when, what tools will be added, what kinds of uh, procedures and protocols we need to establish in order to make this all work together. Now, as far as the cost containment goes, it's been pretty stable. This is a fee chart from 2011, and you don't really need to look a whole lot past the 1500 level because we don't really get too many schools that are past the 1500 maximum level users. Um, but this is the cost per year. In addition, um, the workshop fee work free workshop registrations is talking about the summer workshops that we've had and how many people from your campus can go to that conference it's a week-long conference for free in 2017 the costs were about like this which amounts to 1150 per user for most levels to compare that <coughs> to compare that to what you might do if you are self-hosting of an open source or if you use a commercial product and have to host it yourself, you can see there's quite a cost differential. And this is one of the main things that appeals to poor small schools is that bottom line, that 14,000-ish a year. And that's going to make every difference. Martin did a comparison of a small private school in Florida and a, a cost comparison of what it cost for them to use the LMS they were currently using and what it would cost to do the same kind of thing using LAMP. And without me reading it for you, you can see that there's quite a cost savings, quite a difference, and yet the function is not any different as far as being able to service the students, being able to offer them the content and the material that they need. Now, the, <clears throat> some of the challenges that we have in LAMP, being multiple institutions with one instance of Sakai, um, 
how do we brand? How do, how do I maintain my school identity? How do I look like I'm not everybody else's school? What about course IDs and, and data processing? Because as it turns out, my English 101 is not your English 101. We need to be able to differentiate that. How about our users? How do we track which users go to this school, which users go to that school? And how do we make sure that we have secure sign-ons? How do we coordinate with different student information systems? And the, probably the biggest problem that we've had for the whole 15 years that we've been trying to do this is getting faculty compliance with things, with these protocols that we come into, especially with course, uh, with course designations and that kind of thing. Now, here we have some of our different um, uh, skins from different schools. This isn't all of them by any means, but you can see they all have a different feel and a look and a different color palette. Uh, so we want to maintain those identities. This required developing protocols in a form that, um, that we fill out and say, okay, I want my banner to look like this and here's the graphic for my logo and I want my buttons to be this color and the, and the links to be that color. So that all had to be developed and formed as far as course naming protocols, again, how do you differentiate what course goes where? And that became a big topic for discussion. So what we did was we decided that each campus would get a two digit designation that would, that would be their designator for all their courses. And then uh, with an underscore separating it, you can see the BV in the center, they didn't quite get the underscore in that one. Um, but then the school determines the, the rest of the field values so that they know uh, they can trace their course to the semester, to the section number, that kind of thing. Um, the, the difficulty has been like with the ones on the bottom, those are some that have been originated by faculty members and they just put in whatever they want. And so how do we develop a system where we bypass the faculty members and their discretion in naming their courses? So we developed a, a system whereby the course creation, the course shells were automatically created in communication with the student information system. And um, then the roster would go into that officially created shell so that whatever the teacher created would be basically irrelevant. If they put content in there, they would have to copy it into the official shell. Now that requires an extra fee and some compliance um, with the campus to sign into that process because it required extra coding and extra programming. But now we have this course uh, numbering protocol and that makes it easier to track user statistics from the separate, from the separate campuses and uh, give analytics out to administrators and um, instructional resource people. Now in 2010, the Appalachian College Association had a change in leadership and they said, Mar Martin, you want this? And he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> And, and so his company, Seif, uh, took over ownership and total control. And what ha that has done for uh, LAMP is that has actually mean, meant that we are no longer limited to Appalachian College Association members. In fact, we are no longer limited to academic members. And so we can open up to all kinds of organizations, and we have. Um, there were no real functional changes for current members of LAMP when this change happened. It was a smooth, seamless trans transition, uh, but still, again, it opened resources in, in ways that had not been anticipated early on. The LAMP member structure looks something like this. Each campus or organization has up to two campus coordinators. These campus coordinators report problems and they report uh, data to Martin so that when you need forms submitted for skins or batch loads of uh, users that are uploaded if they're not being communicated with the SIS or whatever information Martin needs from the campus goes through the campus coordinator. Um, the campus coordinator receives any troubleshooting problems and reports those 
to Martin for uh, remediation and he can say, oh, well, we saw that over here and we saw the same thing over there and maybe that's related to the problem that so-and-so was, was dealing with and can resolve those really usually pretty quickly, sometimes having to go through long site. There are monthly meetings uh, for information and government governance purposes so that we get up, updated on new tools or new features or problems that have been there. Um, we have been deciding uh, the, what tools we're going to select as a collaboration or that will make tools available that campuses can subscribe to. For instance, Warpwire, we've had three and now four campuses that use Warpwire, but the if a campus doesn't want to, they don't have to. Some others, they will use. Uh, we've also been collaborating on the timing of upgrades. Every year we have participated in, in the Sakai upgrades from version 2.2, and the next week we will upgrade to version 20. Um, but that's been decided with a, a committee process, which has been a little, now five, Martin says, we're up to five on warp wire, that's good. Um, but the timing of upgrades gets a little dicey because it's a matter of saying, okay, when does no, anybody having no classes? And there's not any time when no one is, there's never a gap. There's always classes happening in LAMP some, on some schedule or another, whether it's a block schedule or it's a half semester or it's a compressed course or whatever. There's always, in fact, we found that there's never a time when nobody's on LAMP. That's, I knew I was going to run into trouble with my multiple negatives, but you get, there's always activity on LAMP. Every year we've had, um, conferences until this year we've had yearly conferences for training and governance with the emphasis really on training and pedagogy uh, that's come to be called lamp camp I'm a little more on that in a second and then we've had an advisory council about four five six people who has who um just kind of give Martin a little bit of feedback when a particular situation might come up if if a member maybe is delinquent on their fees or uh, something like that and so that's been the the function of the advisory council or to approve membership of a new member now the the summer camp the uh, lamp camp summer conference on tra uh, teaching and pedagogy has really been pedagogy based and we've always had sessions for people who are new to Sakai um, so that they can get those basic skills but as we've gotten more and more people um, into uh, into being more and more skilled, we found that, uh, well, we need to talk about um, how to plan for such and such and it, it ranges. It ranges from um, Oh, you know, a plagiarism to um, some of the more technical stuff and, and well, you can see with Chuck Severance sitting there talking to Laura Geckler that there's going to be some interesting conversations there. And then Laura's talking to me. She's talking to me there about the idea of uh, LAMP becoming a, a member of the Aperio Foundation, which we did that year. Um, we have a big group picture and I think you can see Neil Caden in the front of that group. But what we did to what we've been doing together at those summer conferences is we play, we eat, and we work and we talk. This this has been a really key event for our time through the years. This year we had planned to uh, kind of um, piggyback onto the Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, open aperio, but we all know how that's worked out. But this has really been a, a key thing that kind of brings us all together and helps to make us feel like a, like family and like we're really in this together. The monthly web conferences look a little bit like this. I think this was our first uh, big blue button video call, but uh, we just were, th were there together talking about these issues with a free chat format um, and uh, last strictly an hour. Now some tools that we've added to our instance of Sakai include these tools. Um, and on some of them like Verisite, we've kind of been at the forefront of, of 
the, the impetus for developing some of these things. And so it's been interesting to see the development of how Sakai is realized across these several campuses. The these are the current members of LAMP. Those with the asterisk have been added just in the last few months. And um, the rest, the, where I've got the FTEs in parentheses next to them, I wanted to point out the size of these schools, because this is key when I talk about being um, <clears throat> when I talk about being a small fish in a big ocean, because I know that there are a lot of institutions out there that have uh, multiple thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of students, but we have one school here that's more like 125 students, and yet they have a, a big voice in this little consortium that has having a bigger and bigger voice in LAMP. Um, I, I will speak to that in a second, Greg. <clears throat> the point I wanted to make about Clear Creek, for instance, as we change over into a slightly different emphasis in our monthly meetings, Clear Creek has some lessons to talk to us about, about um, competency-based education, and they're going to share those decisions. How we, how, what we, behind our tooling decisions, a warp wire is a marvelous tool, and Johnson is one of the users, and yet I can say that KCU is not one of the users because of cost, and it's a, it's a matter of whether or not a school is willing to put up the cost for those tools that are optional. If they see the benefit, to themselves on having that tool, they can elect to have it. Otherwise, they don't. Um, the the warp wire seemed to have a really good value for what it was offering, and it's proven in our experience to be an increasing value. But again, if a school is not using those the affordances of live streaming for whatever reason, they will say, "Well, we're just not going to pay for that." And cost is such a big determining factor if it was easy to just say well yeah sure we could have it available but we're not going to use it and we're not going to pay two thousand dollars a year to have it because those kinds of costs make all the difference and that's one reason why lamp is successful is it because it keeps the cost down and it keeps what it can uh, optional so that the school can elect not to use it um, some different organizations that we have there, an organization that deals with ePortfolio solutions, editorial freelancers, is just for professional support. Um, the uh, NDEO, National Dance Education Organization, is for dancing instructors. And they just share videos on, and it's a repository that they can refer to for videos that they need. The idea being that um, all sorts of little fish out there that otherwise don't have an LMS voice or an online presence voice can um, can grab a hold of a resource like this and of training options and of uh, community options that they would not otherwise be able to participate in. You can see that we have a lot of documented LAMP activity um, and like I said, there's never a time when LAMP is quiet. There's always activity on LAMP. Um, just, and we had a peak around 2015. It slacked off a little bit. We're, we're working on getting those memberships up and getting that activity back up. Now, when I talk about being a small fish that thrives in a big ocean, Martin thrives. Martin's doing wonderfully. He's, he's, so energized by this whole thing. He re we, uh, Lamp received a, a, an award from the Mellon Foundation in 2008. There he's receiving the stipend from uh, Vince Cerf, who was the founder of the IP address. And, and what was it, two years ago, you became an Aperio Fellow. And there's uh, Ian Dolphin congratulating you with your Aperio Fellow shirt. So proud of you. And uh, Lamp became a member of the Aperio Foundation. Um, I thrive. 
uh, became an, an Uber coordinator. Uh, I decided, I remember a conversation that I had with Martin and I said, have you ever heard of an instructional designer? And he said, yeah, I have. And he says, he told me what it was. And I said, oh, I could do that. And he said, you already do. And so I made it official. And in 2012, I got a master of education with a specialty in instructional design and technology. Um, and, and that was a late in life decision for me. 2012 was the year I turned 60. Um, I moved to Johnson University in 2016, and since then, participating in the accessibility group, um, in the Sakai virtual conference group, in the up forums upgrades, and this year I was the committee chair for the Atlas Awards, um, and I continue to participate in different groups and discussions. This is a voice that I wouldn't have as just a little person off in a remote rural school somewhere and so i'm thrilled kentucky christian university thrives they have a vigorous rn to bsn program that is expanded to an msn program all online and they just have been um, shaking up that whole eastern kentucky western west virginia southern ohio area in creating all these nurses with advanced degrees and this the hospitals love it they underwrite their the students expenses and now kcu's are into bsn program ranked number two in the state of kentucky and you're talking schools like you know uk and louisville and, um, university of louisville and eku and moorhead state and you know and and kcu has the number two program in the state Johnson's thriving. Johnson was selected by best online colleges in Tennessee as the number six online program in the state. And so we're, we're doing great. Now, LAMP going forward is looking at more central governance so that there will be less uh, participation by the member schools in, uh, in the governance decision because we're looking to increase administrative stability. Martin's wanting to increase his staff. It's also a time like this also shows a little bit more um, agile decision making. He doesn't have to wait until the next meeting and maybe table it for three months or whatever. Uh, he, he can make these decisions and just kind of increase that stability overall. The increased financial stability comes through the increased membership. And the monthly meetings are going to shift to focus on pedagogy issues rather than just on governance issues. The future of LAMP camp is still to be decided, but I was, I've kind of been watching the chat. I think I've come up on, uh, I think I've answered questions as they've come along, but just to leave you with the idea that, um, that we have found a model here that anybody could follow if they have a driving energy behind it, which Martin has largely been, and people who are willing to invest themselves and participate in the potluck. Um, I but if you know of a group that needs to go this way, I think we have set out a great model for following. And if you know schools or other organizations that need a boost up into the Sakai community, we have it. Okay. All right, you got a couple minutes left. So if anybody has any questions. Martin says lamp camp has to continue, and I, and I think I think he's right. But we're still talking about it. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like, um, right. but it's it just just seeing those pictures, Terry. I'm like, oh yeah, we got to keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we have almost 15 years of those pictures. So. Yeah, we do. Yeah, <laughs> we take a we take a big picture every year. Yeah. Okay, well, if there's no uh, further questions for Terry, I'd like to thank everybody for attending um, the session today. And we have about a 10 minute uh, break in between sessions. Um, so you can make your way to the next um, topic that you'd like to attend and um, have a great day. Thanks everybody. <laughs>